Great. Well, welcome everybody to one of our Anne Klebanski Visiting Lecture Series. This is our 10th Anne Klebanski Visiting Lecture. My name is Louisa Sylvia. I'm the Director for the Office of Women's Careers in the Center for Faculty Development. In today's session, uh, we are going to have Dr. Connor Kearns. We'll talk about enhancing the detection and treatment of anxiety disorders in autistic youth. And our very own, I always love how we say that, our very own Dr. Robin Tom from MGH will be talking about assessment and treatment of anxiety in Williams syndrome. And then it's going to do a little bit of a background as to what this lecture series is. If this is your first time here, um, this is a really important part of our programming in the Office of Women's Careers and the Center for Faculty Development. So the Anne Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award was created to give MGH women faculty the opportunity to serve as a virtual visiting professor and give grand rounds or some other important talk at a national or international institution organized by their AK scholar or champion. The lecture series is named after Ann Klebanski, who's uh, a president and CEO of MGB and former director actually of the CFD. She's also a very successful researcher and a very strong supporter and advocate for women. So we're thrilled to have this named in her honor. We've had several cohorts of the AK Scholar program so far. This is our 2020-2021 group. This is our 2022-2023 group. And then our current group now, we have these 31 scholars. And you'll notice um, that Dr. Tom is highlighted there in the bottom. So great to, again, have her here. Um, and then we cannot uh, do this program without our uh, champions. Uh, these are the folks who really help our scholars to kind of get out in the world and meet people and find new collaborations and potentially new mentors. So we're incredibly grateful for this group and supporting our women faculty. All right. So the visiting lecture series is really what fosters, it's part of the Anklebanski Award. It's just one part of it. And this is what we're highlighting obviously today. And the visiting lecture, lecture series is a way in which we can connect our AK scholars with other people, other women from other institutions and have an opportunity to again, increase in um, sort of uh, collaborations and networks with other people and across institutions. So thrilled to have Dr. Kearns here as well. Um, from her institution, which is highlighted up there, the University of British Columbia. All right, now to get into specifically to today with Dr. Connor Kearns, who is a licensed psychologist, associate professor of psychology and director of the Anxiety, Stress and Autism program at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Her research focuses on better understanding and assessing and treating anxiety and stress-related conditions in autistic youth and young adults. So we're thrilled to have her here. And again, Dr. Tom is here at, at the MGH Lurie Center for Autism and the co-director for the MGH Williams Syndrome Program, an assistant professor here at HMS. And her research interests include advancing knowledge of how psychiatric symptoms are diagnosed and treated individuals with neurodevelopment disorders across the lifespan. So these um, talks are very interconnected and quite related. So as a result, we'd really like to encourage people to hold off on their questions till the end. We'll have Dr. Kearns go first and then Dr. Tom, but you're welcome to put your question in the chat so you don't forget it. And then we can get to it at the end after Dr. Tom has given her uh, talk. So with that, I will pass the baton to Dr. Kearns to get started. Thanks so much. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. It's an incredible cool initiative. I'm really glad to be a part of it um, and excited to share this work with you all. So the goal of my talk today would be is to summarize findings uh, from a broad research program where we focused on trying to better understand and therein better detect and treat anxiety disorders in autistic youth. Uh, and I think one of the most effective ways to kind of deepen understanding when I give a talk like this is to actually use the words of autistic individuals and their caregivers to convey how anxiety affects autistic children and their families. So I'll be using quotes to guide us through the talk today. And I wanna note that these quotes are actually research findings in and of themselves. They're pulled from qualitative research on anxiety and autism, which has played a really instrumental role in helping to connect the growing quantitative research on anxiety and autism to the realities and the clinical needs of autistic uh, clients and the providers who serve them. Okay. Sometimes anxiety can build up on itself like a brick on an accelerator pedal. Whenever you make a mistake due to anxiety, you become more anxious. It's something that keeps being in your head and you can't get it out and you can't focus on other things. 
So anxiety disorders differ from anxiety, which is an emotion we all experience and which typically serves an adaptive function. Anxiety helps us stay safe, plan for the future, get things done. Anxiety disorders occur when that typically adaptive, informative emotional system, instead of helping us navigate our lives, shuts us down because all becomes all encompassing. Anxiety disorders really dominate and deplete our attention as opposed to adaptively directing it. And research suggests that anxiety disorders are associated with specific additional difficulties for autistic individuals, such as increased depression and self-injurious behavior, reduced quality of life, more sleep problems, gastrointestinal illness, a reduced willingness to initiate social interaction and increased family stress. He shuts himself down and he goes to bed. He'll be in that room for 15 hours. So children can become so overwhelmed and depleted by their anxiety that they withdraw from the world for extended periods. A mother whose son has a severe dog phobia describes, I am risk assessing where it's appropriate to go and what is safe. I'm a single parent, so I have to really think, where can we go, where can we manage and what's safe? And as a part of that risk assessment, I will think, will there be any dogs? So every time I go out, I consider the difficulties that may arise to minimize the anxiety. Every trip out the door requires an accounting of risks, feasibility, safety. Anxiety disorders make it hard not only for autistic individuals, but also their families to navigate the world around them and complete daily tasks. And I always like to talk about the subtler costs of anxiety as well. There's the parable of the little engine that could. It's the little engine that wills its over itself over a big hill carrying a very heavy train by saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. What makes anxiety disorders particularly dangerous and debilitating in my mind is that when you have an anxiety disorder, you look at a challenge and you think, I can't. You not only have to deal with that hill, you have to deal with the doubt. There are many challenges in life, and this may be particularly true for autistic individuals, but there's a distinction between the challenge itself and the psychological distress and suffering that often accompanies and exacerbates it. Reducing anxiety is a way to remove that additional layer of difficulty and thus to make a huge difference in the lives of people on the spectrum. We may not be able to take away all the challenges they experience, but we can work on building resilience rather than suffering in the face of those challenges. Anxiety disorders also, if accurately detected, present a problem with enormous promise. And I say this because like in holistic or non-autistic youth, research is now suggesting that anxiety disorders can be effectively treated in autistic children with fluent language abilities. A 2019 review found that across randomized clinical trials, 58 to 71% of autistic youth had a remission of their primary anxiety disorder following cognitive behavioral treatment. Up on the screen, you see the main findings from the Treatment of Anxiety and Autism Spectrum Disorder Trial or the TASED trial. It was the most rigorous randomized clinical trial of CBT and autism to date, given its size and its comparison of two active CBT conditions. So in this study, 167 children ages seven to 13 were randomized to either a standard CBT coping cat or an adapted modular program adapted for autism, the BIACA program, or treatment as usual. And in the graph, you can see anxiety severity assessed by the mean severity of score on the pediatric anxiety rating scale, on the y-axis and time on the x-axis from pre to mid treatment, which is about eight weeks to post-intervention, which is about 16 weeks. As you can see, both treatment conditions, which are the orange and blue lines on this graph, uh, were significantly more effective than treatment as usual in reducing anxiety severity. And the researchers also found that children made the greatest gains in the adapted program. Interestingly, as is often the case for many child CBT programs in general, we see that the most substantial improvements and the clearest divergence from treatment as usual is in the second half of treatment, which is when exposure begins. That's when kids are actively applying the coping skills they learn at the start of treatment to face their fears and support with, this, with the support of their therapists and families. Positive treatment response defined as a rating of very improved or improved on the clinician global improvement scale was 92% in, in the adapted program, 81% in standard CBT compared to only 11% in treatment as usual. 
reductions in general inter internalizing symptoms, autism-related social communication impairments, and also social difficulties associated with anxiety were also greater in adapted versus standard CBT. So we're seeing here that there are some advantages for tailored programs, but also importantly, standard CBT seems to be helpful. So what are these adaptations? They often include um, greater parent involvement in every session of the treatment or additional parent sessions, uh, incorporating the keen knowledge and passion some autistic kids have for particular, particular topics into treatment as a motivator to promote engagement, uh, increasing executive functioning supports and using even more concrete visual and interactive strategies and very importantly, in some programs, targeting not only the anxiety, but also related challenges that may come up in autism. So for example, when treating social anxiety, incorporating social skills supports as well. Importantly, both group as well as individual programs have now been empirically supported. Facing Your Fears is a good example of a well-studied group program. And as I mentioned, these tailored approaches, that is CBT programs that are adapted to autistic use seem to offer some advantages, but the research is still clear that standard CBC, CBT can be helpful. Moreover, the research base is growing, and I think this is kind of the most exciting area, and it's focusing on expanding access. So we see an emerging work supports the efficacy of CBT for adults, of behavioral and modified CBT approaches to treat anxiety in autistic youth who have intellectual disability, school-based and stepped care programs that aim to get these interventions to people expediently and cost-effectively. But in many ways, this first half of the talk is actually all prelude, as one of my main goals in the talk is actually to convince you that to meaningfully address the challenge of anxiety and autism, to, to kind of be most effective, we have to begin by actually better recognizing and understanding the diverse ways that anxiety is experienced and expressed by autistic individuals. How we define and assess anxiety disorders in autistic individuals, how we draw the lines regarding what to conceptualize as autism versus anxiety itself, that has huge implications for estimating the size and the characteristics of this public health risk and identifying who's actually in need of and likely to benefit from available treatments. Yet the process of drawing those boundaries is actually not so simple. So a mother describes, sometimes it's very difficult to understand whether it's an autistic behavior or whether it's behavior caused by anxiety or both. And my hunch is that most expert clinicians would probably tell you the exact same thing. There are several reasons why drawing the lines or making, making those distinctions between autism and anxiety can be so challenging. Um, one reason goes back to how we actually differentiate adaptive anxiety from anxiety disorders. So part of how we do this is by evaluating how realistic or protective an individual's fears are. And what we see in autism is many reasons why having more fears might actually make a lot of sense. So here we have Richard, an autistic adult, who discusses his social anxiety. He worries, does this person like me? This is a quintessential social anxiety fear, but Richard also recounts others who are not interested in me, the other children ignored me. So many times um, people on the spectrum are worried about social encounters because they should be, uh, because they're being actively bullied or more subtly, politely, but still painfully excluded. And in such cases, uh, those worries may actually be protective. So I think this quote illustrates how important it is to think carefully about how realistic and adaptive a worry is before we pathologize it, and why that can actually get quite complicated quickly when autism is also in play. Other key reasons why differentiating anxiety disorders and autism can be challenging are the overlap of autism and anxiety symptoms, and the distinct ways that autistic individuals may experience and express their anxiety. So this is a description of Donald. It's uh, written by his father, and it was printed as part of Leo Connor's original characterization of autism in 1943. This summer, we brought him to the playground slide. When other children were sliding on it, he would not get about it. He seemed horror struck. <laughs> 
The next morning when nobody was present, however, he walked out, climbed the ladder and slid down and has slid down it frequently since, but slides only when no other child is present to join him. So Donald's father uses the word horror struck. But the question is, what exactly is Donald afraid of? Perhaps he's afraid that the other kids will tease or dislike him. Alternatively, perhaps Donald's not attuned to or concerned with his peers' judgments yet, but he does fear how unpredictable they are. Perhaps his worries arise from his struggles to know what they want or what they're gonna do. Maybe he's not scared at all, but just distressed because those kids are getting in his way. This quote illustrates, I think, how social avoidance like Donald's might reflect a feature of autism a symptom of anxiety, or some combination of the two. Here are some more recent illustrations. Audrey, I get anxious in social situations as I don't see emotions in people until they get to a 10, and then it's an explosion, and I don't know when it's going to happen. A parking lot can be terrifying because of all the headlights. A mother describes her son's anxiety around changes in routine. At the beginning of the term, they dropped the first period of the first day. M couldn't sleep that weekend. He has to bring the books in for that period, even though he doesn't have it. In all these examples, we see key features of autism highlighted, social communication difficulties, sensory sensitivities, a desire for sameness. But we also see anxieties layered on top. It's not just that M refuses to accept a change in his routine, it's that he was worrying all weekend, unable to sleep because he knows that it's coming. A growing body of research is exploring the possibility that anxiety may come in different varieties in autism, both similar and distinct from the anxieties expressed by allistic or non-autistic youth. And it's our working hypothesis that distinct expressions may reflect anxiety influenced by the different ways that autistic individuals perceive and experience the world. So across several research studies, we've endeavored to carefully characterize anxiety disorders in autistic youth using an adapted clinical interview to reliably differentiate between autism and anxiety related behaviors and to capture these distinct expressions of anxiety so we can learn more about them. And what we see in these studies is 30 to 40% of autistic children do not meet criteria for any anxiety disorders. That is actually really important <laughs> because sometimes it can be really easy to think that all kids with autism have anxiety disorders, but that's not actually the case. So remember that. About 50% of autistic youth do have traditional anxiety disorders. That is, they meet criteria for anxiety disorders that are similar to those seen in allistic youth and that are cataloged by the DSM. 50% or more of kids with those traditional anxiety disorders also have impairing distinct anxieties. That is for about a third of autistic kids, traditional and distinct anxieties coexist. And finally, across these studies, 15 to 17% of autistic youth have only distinct anxiety presentations. That means depending on how we want to characterize those distinct fears as autism or anxiety, it could change our estimate of the prevalence of anxiety disorder and autism by up to 17%. And I just wanna note that in these studies, um, we've used this adapted version of the anxiety disorders interview schedule with an autism spectrum addendum in order to make these careful characterizations and really see who's meeting criteria for traditional DSM defined anxiety disorders versus these more distinct varieties of anxiety that we see in autism, but which are still clinically impairing. Um, and what the interview does is it provides guidelines and additional prompts to the clinician when they're using the ATIS to differentiate overlapping autism and anxiety symptoms in a systematic way, to query for these dis distinct expressions of anxiety. And it puts a lot of behavioral, even more emphasis than usual on behavioral examples uh, particularly for youth who have more limited language skills to really get at um, if anxiety is there and how it's getting in the way of the child's life. And we have seen good inter-rater and retest reliability across studies. Uh, we've seen good inter-rater reliability from preschoolers all the way through teens uh, using this interview. 
which has predominantly been a parent report at this moment, um, particularly because we're trying to use it for younger children and kids who also have intellectual disability. Okay. So using this interview or applying the same approach to better understand the anxiety presentation of autistic children, uh, we looked at the anxiety presentation of kids who are actually seeking treatment as part of the TASED trial, which I mentioned before. And what we learned from this study was that actually the vast majority of those kids met criteria for traditional anxiety disorder. Only 2%, that's the light, lightest blue square um, section of this, um, had solely a distinct presentation in the TASE trial. However, 50% of kids meeting criteria for traditional anxiety disorder also had interfering distinct fears. So what I think this means is that distinct anxieties may be very common on autistic children receiving CBT, even if they weren't the fears that actually got them into treatment. It also suggests that children with only distinct presentations may be less frequently recognized and experiencing anxiety and uh, as experiencing anxiety and requiring anxiety treatment. Whether this holds true in community treatment settings really requires further study, but I think these initial findings from the research studies provide strong rationale for better understanding these distinct fears. Uh, their role in autistic children's clinical presentation and their expected treatment response. Research also suggests that carefully considering the presentation of anxiety disorders may shed light on how intellectual abilities relate to anxiety and autism. So in this study from 2020, we found similar rates of children with versus without intellectual impairments presenting with impairing traditional and distinct anxieties. However, when we looked at the types of anxiety disorders being reported across groups, differences emerged. So specifically, the anxiety of children with intellectual impairments was primarily comprised of specific phobias, things like fears of dogs, dentists, heights, loud sounds, and also of distinct anxieties. This is meaningful as it suggests that cognitive abilities are potentially related to the expression of a child's anxiety disorder, more so than the likelihood that they will have one. It also offers some insight into why studies suggest that brief anxiety questionnaires that have been developed and normed on non-autistic samples have diminished accuracy in autistic youth. The traditional anxiety presentations that those measures screen for reflect just one part of the picture for autistic children, and it might be a particularly small part for autistic youth with intellectual disability um, rather than the complete picture. And finally, by taking the time to assess and differentiate traditional and distinct presentations of anxiety, we've also learned that they're associated with significant differences in the volume of the amygdala, the brain's fear center. Um, that is an oversimplification, forgive me, but, um, but they might be associated with the amygdala in uh, disparate ways. So specifically in this recent study, um, which is just the first study, so it certainly has to be replicated, but in this recent study, we found that youth with only DSM anxiety had significantly larger amygdala volumes, that's the top red line on this depiction, whereas those with only distinct anxiety had smaller amygdala volumes relative to one another and to allistic or non-autistic children. Some limitations and thoughts for future research. Um, it's important to note that in all the studies I've presented today, the samples um, were limited to predominantly white and male children, and that certainly needs to be corrected in the future. We've also relied a lot on parent reported interviews or parent interviews with clinicians, as opposed to interviewing both parents and youth. Oh, we did do that in one study. Um, there's a need to look at the response of distinct anxiety to CBT intervention specifically, and also to start to look at these underlying mechanisms. So to understand what really contributes to these distinct expressions, and also to think in a broader way, I think about how adversity and potentially traumatic experiences are contributing to the mental health of autistic children. And finally, uh, there's a need for increased emphasis on dissemination and implementation. So Connor, we're back to Connor from 1943 again. He wrote of Alfred in his original case series. He had a good deal of worrying. He, had, he frets when the bread is put in the oven to be made into toast. He's afraid it will get burned and be hurt. He's upset when the sun sets. He's upset because the moon does not always appear in the sky at night. To address the challenge of anxiety and autism, we must begin by better recognizing and understanding these distinct expressions of anxiety. Thus far, our research suggests they are prevalent and impairing for autistic individuals, 
They're also likely under-recognized and under-treated in the population and adding considerable variability or noise to research seeking to characterize not only anxiety and autism, but autism itself if they're not assessed. And I have questions, but I'll actually take questions at the end and pass this over to Dr. Tom now. Great, thank you so much. And we'll get Dr. Tom to share. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Dr. Kearns. Um, it, it's such a great honor to um, share this talk with you, um, not only because um, because of your uh, foundational role in autism and anxiety work, but because uh, so much of your work has been such an inspiration for some of the work I'm going to be talking about today, um, which is uh, on the assessment and treatment of anxiety in a specific genetic syndrome called Williams syndrome. So here are my disclosures, and I will say that we will be talking about off-label uses of medication uh, because there actually are no FDA-approved medications for Williams syndrome. So what is Williams syndrome? Well, Williams syndrome is a relatively rare genetic syndrome. It's caused by the deletion of 25 to 27 genes on one of the two chromosome sevens. It occurs in about one in 7,000 or so individuals. So uh, across the United States, about 30,000 or so people are affected. Pretty much all the cells in the body are affected. So um, uh, a lot of the different organ systems in the body are of course affected. Um, the three main ones to keep in mind though, are the brain, the heart, and the GI tract. I've put up some examples of the common medical issues in Williams syndrome to give you a sense. The numbers here really aren't important though. The more important thing to keep in mind is that even though the genetic deletion is pretty much the same in people with Williams syndrome, we see a lot of heterogeneity and variability in exactly which medical conditions and which psychiatric conditions affect different people. Intellectual disability is, is pretty universal though. Um, the IQ range can be pretty broad um, from about 40 to 90, that's a, that's a huge split. And really at the end of the day, IQ does not tell the full story. The reason for that is, is because we see these big peaks and also valleys in uh, cognitive ability. So most people with Williams syndrome have quite strong language skills, um, and um, but really clear deficits in math skills, planning, judgment, problem solving, and visuospatial skills. So to give you a little bit of a sense, if you ran into a person with Williams syndrome at the bus stop, they would probably strike up quite a lovely conversation with you. What you may not gather from that type of conversation though, is that more likely than not, the person you're talking to probably would not be able to tell time using an analog clock, even with a lot of practice and teaching. They probably could not accurately calculate change. And many adults with Williams syndrome actually need assistance with very basic daily activities, like making sure their shirts are put on in the correct orientation and supervision for brushing with their teeth, um, because more likely than not, they would brush like one quadrant and not realize that, that they haven't gotten all of their teeth. Um, if you went to medical school and remembered one thing for medical boards, you probably recall the cocktail personality of Williams syndrome. Um, and in many patients, this is true, but certainly not all. I can't overemphasize the heterogeneity of the syndrome in my talk today. Um, but many patients with Williams syndrome are highly social, empathetic, friendly, gregarious. Um, but what we didn't learn when we studied for boards was that there's much more to the story. Um, accompanying this very high social drive, most people with Williams syndrome also have significant social skill deficits. And this is where the story gets more interesting and kind of dovetails with a lot of Dr. Kern's work um, because as you're thinking, oh, they have difficulties with perspective taking, interpreting social cues, developing and sustaining long-term friendships that starts to look a little bit like autism. We know that rates of psychopathology are pretty high in Williams syndrome, even in children. Um, this was an older study published almost 20 years ago now, but even then um, it was clear that when you administer a structured interview, more than 80% of kids with Williams syndrome have at least one mental health concern. The most common being ADHD and anxiety disorders. The story is pretty much the same in adults. Um, the anxiety doesn't really fade 
ADHD kind of does, which is what we'd expect based on the neurotypical population. But we also see some other disorders like mood disorders start to creep in. Um, what I can tell you from my clinical experience is that Williams syndrome certainly is not protective against psychopathology. Um, and we see some pretty rare disorders in clinically, uh, for example, catatonia, schizophrenia, and functional neurological disorders. We've seen the full gamut of psychopathology in clinic. When I first started doing research in Williams syndrome, I was really fortunate to be connected very early on by mentors to patients and families in the community, largely through the Williams Syndrome Associations. And I was able to have many conversations with parents, family, patient representatives about what they viewed as their biggest needs and challenges. And the theme that kept coming up was parents were saying, we've really got to figure out a way to diagnose and treat anxiety disorders, mainly treat. They kind of knew that their kids were anxious. So where I wanted to start was really inspired by a lot of Dr. Kearns and her colleagues' work, feeling that if we want to develop a treatment for anxiety, we must have a very good way of identifying who has an anxiety disorder where it's psychopathology rather than a normal human emotion. And we have to be able to measure change with treatment so that we know if the treatment is working. So this is really where we started. What we did was we interviewed 100 patients with Williams syndrome across the full age span and cognitive ability. Um, if the person with Williams syndrome was able to participate in the interviews, we interviewed them. We also interviewed their parents. Some components were done individually and some were done together to get a really detailed look at how anxiety affects this population with the goal of developing a structured uh, interview, um, uh, interview uh, guide similar to what Dr. Kearns has developed um, and also a, a parent rating questionnaire. We don't have our rating scale just yet, but I wanted to show you some of the data that we have. So this is the pediatric anxiety rating scale score. Um, on the x-axis, you can see the level of anxiety. To the right, you see higher numbers, and that means more anxiety. And each blue dot represents a person with Williams syndrome. I put the red line at the threshold of 10, because that's really the threshold at which people can enroll in an anxiety treatment trial. So as you can see, not everybody with Williams syndrome has cl clinically significant anxiety, but a good proportion have enough anxiety that they probably warrant treat. We also saw some recurring themes in terms of the type of anxiety when we interviewed these patients. We saw a lot of sensory-based fears. Um, many of them in Williams syndrome are focused on noise. So things like thunderstorms, fire alarms, dogs barking, those would be three common fears. Um, we also heard a lot of anticipatory anxiety, meaning that people were very concerned about what was coming up in the future. And oftentimes people would worry about things that were in the far, far future. Um, just last week, I saw a patient with Williams syndrome who was very concerned that I would administer him a flu shot, even though A, I'm a psychiatrist, and B, we were meeting on Zoom. Um, but he was very preoccupied by this fear throughout the entire visit. And I figured like, okay, well, it's almost flu season. It kind of makes sense that he's worried about this, but his mom clarified, oh no, he's been talking about this since March and I really can't get him to stop. Uh, so that's kind of a classic example of how anticipatory anxiety might manifest in a pathologic way. Um, the third theme that came up and was a little bit of a surprise to us, but really intriguing was we did see themes of social anxiety. Um, and prior to doing this research, we wouldn't necessarily have expected this because many people thought that Williams syndrome with that highly social, gregarious, friendly personality would be protective against social anxiety. But when we ask people, do you worry a lot about embarrassing yourself, making a mistake, being criticized? That Does that affect your social functioning? Does that lead you to not go to social activities? They're saying yes, 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 or at least a good subset. Um, I will note that we really didn't see many social anxiety fears in younger patients, but these types of anxieties started to crop up, not in all, but a good subset of patients in their later 20s and 30s and beyond. 
Um, just like Dr. Kearns mentioned in her talk, um, particularly in patients who had less language ability or lower cognitive ability, um, we had to be very careful to look for um, behavioral signs and symptoms, things that we could observe or parents could observe relatively objectively to suggest anxiety. Um, and we certainly saw more repetitive body movements, which may be a signal for anxiety, like rocking or rubbing. And then more of the kind of externalizing behaviors like tantrums, crying, anything that one can do to avoid a situation that's making someone feel scared. So we know that anxiety is common, um, can be severe, and has a negative impact on quality of life. So what do we do about it? Um, well, we've already heard a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And I thought it would just be fantastic if we could bring this gold standard treatment to the Williams syndrome population. We knew though that it would have to be modified um, to account not only for the cognitive and language profile of this population, but also adults with Williams syndrome can be kind of stubborn. They really don't wanna to be told what to do and it's very difficult to get them to do something unless they wanna do it. So I had this great opportunity two years ago to collaborate with psychologists at the Lurie Center um, and also an external collaborator, Dr. McGuire at um, Hopkins. And we worked together to try and modify CBT for adults with Williams syndrome. We of course had to modify the content so that it was cognitively accessible. We included a lot of repetition for practice. Um, we incorporated caregivers after looking at the autism literature. Um, and so those were kind of some of the content modifications we made. In addition, we really thought about how could we deliver this treatment in a way that would be fun, engaging, and um, in a way that would make people want to use the CBT skills. Uh, so we thought it was important that we do it in a group format to kind of capitalize on the highly social nature of people with Williams syndrome. Um, we use a lot of humor. We tried to include examples that felt really relevant to adults' lives. Um, and honestly, the group was a blast. Um, I don't think I've ever had more fun doing therapy before or after. Um, we had four people enroll in our initial group. As you can see, the PARS or the anxiety scores came down for all four patients. And we got a lot of positive feedback, both from the patients themselves and their parents. I still treat a couple of these patients in my practice. And some parents now, two years later, still say, yep, that coping plan really works. We still have many laminated copies and use it from time to time. So as it's great to know that people are continuing to use skills. On the medication side, one thing we know um, generally is that patients with neurodevelopmental disorders often don't respond quite the same way to psychotropic medications as the general population. And one observation we had in clinic was that buspirone, which is FDA approved for generalized anxiety disorder, seemed to be uniquely effective for treating anxiety in patients with Williams syndrome. So we wrote this up a few years ago now, um, explaining the treatment course and what happened in three people after we treated them with buspirone, their anxiety went away more or less. But of course, that's not the standard of medical evidence that we aspire to. So we then said, okay, well, let's look at all of the patients that we've treated in the whole clinic who have Williams syndrome and anxiety and have received buspirone. And at the time we had 24 patients who met this criteria. Uh, we've gathered more and more over the years since. Um, but based on these 20, initial 24 patients, I should say, um, there was quite a high response rate. So nearly 70% of patients who received this medication were considered treatment responders. And then even more, almost more importantly and remarkably, nobody got worse on this treatment. And I know that sounds like a low bar, but it's pretty common, honestly, in neurodevelopmental disorders for psychotropic medications to make things much worse. So this was a really, really promising starting point. So based on that data, we felt compelled to do a trial. Uh, we thought it was important to raise the bar of medical evidence that we have in treating anxiety in this population. So what we did was we ran an open label trial. It was generously funded by the Williams Syndrome Association. We brought in 20 people with Williams Syndrome and anxiety. All of them got buspirone. We had contact with them for four months. We measured their anxiety over time, kept a close eye for side effects. And I am so pleased to say that we actually finished our last study visit just yesterday. Uh, so hope to have those data to share very soon.
So where does that leave us? Well, you know, really standing on the shoulders, shoulders of giants, people like Dr. Kearns, who've done this foundational and tremendous work in autism and anxiety, we've started to move the ball forward for this specific genetic syndrome. We're getting a better sense of how anxiety presents, how to measure it, and how we might go about treating it. Clearly, a lot, a lot of work remains. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out is an area that we must do better in, and that is really thinking about how to do research in a way that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we heard a little bit about the limitations of the autism research from Dr. Kearns earlier, um, but sadly, we're, we're really doing no better in Williams syndrome. Um, and I'll quickly show some data supporting this. This is work that was done by a stellar and talented undergraduate student who worked with us for two summers. She pulled all of the Williams syndrome treatment research. 11 studies had been published. And we found that only two of the 11 even reported on racial and ethnic breakdown. And then when you pool those data, 90% of people who represent the full treatment literature in Williams syndrome are white. Now, this is not unique to um, racial and ethnic representation problems. We also found that uh, people who participate in trials tend to be younger, um, typically under 30 on average, and also of higher IQ than we would expect um, for the full range of Williams syndrome. So a few takeaway points. Um, you all know now that Williams syndrome is a rare genetic disorder, affects multiple um, areas of the body. Psychopathology is common, and particularly anxiety disorders. We've come a long way in the past 80 years since Williams syndrome was described, uh, but we have a lot of work left to be done. And I hope I've inspired one or two of you in the audience to join forces because this is really a wonderful community and a lot of fun. Um, I have to say that none of this work would be possible uh, without the patients and families who entrust us to take care of them clinically and those who donate their time to research. Um, my Williams syndrome research has been supported by a number of organizations, including the WSA, Mass General, the Nancy Lurie Marx Family Foundation, the Vernon family. Um, and also a big thank you and shout out to um, the team that's been involved. Uh, it really takes a village, uh, but in particular, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Barbara Pober, um, who is my geneticist colleague and mentor and has taught me everything I know about Williams syndrome. Um, and then of course, my psychiatry mentor, Dr. Chris McDougall, uh, the director of the Lurie Center. Thank you and happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you both so much. Please do either um, put your questions in the chat, either directly to me, or you can put it to the, the whole group if you want to do it anonymously, but directly to me and I can raise it to doctors Tom and Kearns. Um, what, what a wonderful, they really were, these talks were really um, nicely dovetailed with one another. And Dr. Kearns, I think you started us off really helping us to kind of characterize um, this population a bit. And I, I loved your use of in both parent, the sort of parent-child description of of um, anxiety and what they were sort of experiencing, which, which sort of led me to a question I had, um, which was, any advice you have? I see, I, I suspect we have some parents and we have some clinicians in the audience and maybe some others, maybe some caregivers. Um, what, what advice do you have to sort of try to sort of separate some of these things and try to better understand these things? If you had any sort of tips for, for people working with the population that you're studying, autistic, anxiety, you know, anxious, autistic kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've kind of taken a systematic approach um, to asking about some core features of autism or characteristics of social functioning and sensory processing and executive functioning that are part of autism that can sometimes make things really confusing when you're trying to figure out is this anxiety or is this something else. Um, for social anxiety. Um, in particular, we tend to ask about a child's basic level of social motivation, because that can really vary across autistic kids. So some kids are really, really socially motivated. <laughs> they want to be engaged. They are quite upset when they're not being included um, in social groups. And other kids, that doesn't bother them as much. Um, we ask about theory of mind or social awareness. So again, there can be huge variability in within the autistic population. Um, some kids are very aware that maybe the other kids don't like him. They're, they're worried about being made fun of, that they'll make a mistake, that they don't know what to do socially and other people will notice. They're very attuned to those things. And that really sets them up to have kind of a classic um, DSM consistent social anxiety disorder. 
But there are other kids who that is not quite on their radar yet, right? So you're as parents um, and just general, the people who work with them don't really notice them talking about yeah. any fears of negative evaluation. And when you actually ask that kind of entry level question about social anxiety disorder, the response from parents is usually like, uh, no, maybe, <laughs> you know, it's really, it's hard for them to answer that because it's, it's not clear actually, if that is something that the child is, is worrying about. And that's where we look for that more distinct expression of there can still be kids on the spectrum who are quite anxious in social situations. It just doesn't seem to be about what other people think about them, or if they're going to be negatively evaluated, it's something else to do with the social situation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's about having trouble predicting what other people are going to do. Sometimes it's sensory and not social at all. So we really have mm. to ask about that. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, sorry, this is a long winded answer because there's so much that goes into this, but yeah. other things we look for is bullying history. Um, because again, we really need to think about what are the actual social strife that the individual is going through before we evaluate the appropriateness of their social fears. And other things we ask about are sensory sensitivity, because that can look a lot like a phobia. Mm. Um, in reality, you can have both a sensory sensitivity and a phobia layered on top. And the way I like to tell people to think about this is, for example, if a kid is afraid of loud sounds, then when they hear loud sounds, they will cover their ears and run out of the room. And they, of course, they don't like it. They're highly distressed. But to diagnose the phobia, we're really looking for the kid who won't even go to school because they're afraid there's going to be a fire alarm that day. Or when they go to a new place, they are like casing the joint for the fire alarms in the building, right? We're looking for the, how the anxiety is there before any loud sound has even happened and how the anxiety is actually getting in the way. Um, finally, we look for just kind of a perseverative cognitive style. So just mm -hmm. getting stuck on thoughts in general can sometimes make a child on the spectrum look more anxious than maybe they actually are <laughs> because mm -hmm. what you bring up, they just tend to get stuck on whether it's an anxiety or something else. Um, so those are just some examples of what's kind of built into the clinical interview and process conceptualization process that we use to try and parse out what's autism, what's anxiety, and what's really when the two things come together, which happens quite a lot. That was great. I actually really appreciate the detail. It was really interesting. Uh, let me open it up now to other people who have questions, again, either raising your hand or sticking something in the chat. While we're waiting for uh, questions, Dr. Kearns, I'll just comment that um, we see a lot of the sensory-based phobias in Williams syndrome as well. Um, many people with Williams syndrome have something called hyperacusis, where they actually find certain sounds like truly aversive or even painful. And what we've seen in our treatment trials is that, um, you know, treatment with buspirone doesn't take away the hyperacusis, but it, it does take away the, you know, anticipatory anxiety. Like, what if there's a dog mm -hmm. at the park? I can't go to the park. But yeah, if the dog approaches them and barks, it's like this, but they're able to like move on much more quickly. I had a question too, if, if I can ask Robin a question. Um, I was wondering about the presentation of social anxiety in the Williams syndrome kids. Mm -hmm. And if you're seeing a lot of it, or if it looks different, because that is something that seems a little bit distinct in terms of autism and Williams. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, this is like really kind of new and somewhat surprising data to us. So I think our answer is still not fully formed. Um, I will say that I think what happens is that as people with Williams syndrome get a little bit older, oftentimes they develop a little bit more social cognition and awareness of how they may be different than their peers. So we don't hear a lot of kids saying like, I'm worried about embarrassing myself. I'm worried about making a mistake. Like they're all really kind of in the mix of the action. They're the school mayor saying hi to every kid as they walk into the school. In adulthood, we, we see a lot of parents say like, I don't know why, but she's no longer in the middle of the action. She's kind of like sitting on the side and observing. In those people, I, th I think we now know to ask, why is it? Are you worried that, you know, people will judge you or laugh at you or, or things like that? Hunter, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what some of the distinct anxiety presentations you're seeing in autism that aren't well captured by DSM diagnoses. Yeah. So one of them is kind of the social, other social fear, we call it, <laughs> which is fear in, in social situations that doesn't have to do with fear of negative evaluation or uh, kind of rejection. Something else about the social situation, usually predictability. Um, other things that we see are really 
um, somewhat idiosyncratic or just uncommon phobias. Um, they seem like they might have a sensory component, but sometimes that's very hard to pin down. So this can be, for example, fear of gloves, fear of glasses, uh, fear of black toilet seats, which remarkably enough has come up with at least three kids that I've worked with, um, the sound, a specific sound. So not loud sounds in general, but a particular tone or a particular song, like the happy birthday song. And it's the happy birthday song. It's not the happy birthday party and all the people. It's really the song. The song is really problematic. Um, a bubble on a pizza, graffiti, exposed pipes. Um, these are actually things that, again, you can see in the literature written about clinically all the way back into the 40s, and we continue to see them today. Um, so that definitely comes up. Another big one is uh, fears of change. And this one's hard because, of course, fears of uncertainty and novelty can be a big part of generalized anxiety. But what we see in autism is sometimes kids who are quite concerned about changes, even small ones, small changes to their schedule, who's picking them up, and there's no separation anxiety. It's about it needs to be the same way each day, changing from short sleeves to long sleeves, so anxiety about changes in the absence of more generalized fears. So it's really specifically about small changes in their routine. That's quite common coming up in the studies. Um, and then finally, not as common, but seen in a small percentage of kids across every study I've done is anxiety that really gets tied into um, the focused interest that a child may have. So some kids on the spectrum have particular areas where they have a keen passion and knowledge base about a particular topic. And for some kids, anxiety can go hand in hand with that in that they develop a lot of anxiety and worry about when am I going to be able to research Japanese literature next? Or when am I going to be able to count my um, SpongeBob SquarePants uh, stuffies kind of thing? And in those cases, we only will give the impairing anxiety if it's really the anxiety about the thing. So for example, waking up at 5 a.m. because you're worried you're going to run out of time at the end of the day to get to your particular interest or worrying all through class about it is getting in the way, we would count that interference. We do not count the interference that can come from just the, the focus itself, which can also often be a lot. And that's why you see in the studies that it's really under 10% of kids have what we call these focused interest fears. Um, and because we're not counting all focused interests, we're just counting the anxiety get, that gets layered on top of that um, for some children. I had another question too for Robin. We can just go. <laughs> I don't know if there's other questions. <laughs> okay. I, I was wondering, Dr. Tom, if because it's the buspirone is really interesting to me because um, I haven't seen anything comparable in terms of treating anxiety and autism, although I've certainly seen some kids on the spectrum on that um, medication in the past. I was wondering if there's anything, anything medical or biological reason associated with Williams syndrome that that type of medication might be particularly effective? That is an excellent question that we are hoping to investigate <laughs> um, in most models and also human neuroimaging. Um, I will say that we've noticed that buspirone does tend to be more effective and more tolerable across the range of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, so including, you know, we publish a paper in Down syndrome, we publish an angel man, we publish in autism, um, uh, looking at buspirone. Um, so may, but I will say, I think it is particularly helpful in Williams syndrome. So there probably is something about the Williams syndrome neurobiology, but also something common about neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and uh, we will actually be doing that trial in autism, a, a randomized controlled mm -hmm. trial of use room for anxiety and autism. That's really exciting. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely struck by the amount of uh, your, your sort of future research areas. It feels like there's a lot to do. So I'm glad you guys are on, in, on it and in this space. Um, any other questions? Um, Dr. Kearns, you mentioned maybe needing to just state your disclosures. I think you said you need to get that in at the outset. Do you want to do that? Yeah, I just, uh, they were after my questions and I forgot to show them and that's really poor practice. So <laughs> just... <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, Especially Dr. Thomas, a really beautiful job with it. <laughs> I think while people are thinking of their questions, let me let me acknowledge all the wonderful funders and and amazing people that contributed to the work because you all know I didn't do it all by myself, right? Team science, team science, uh, that's right. <laughs> um, okay, here are my uh, disclosures. Um, I funding from NICHD um, and several Canadian institutions. The Autism Science Foundation actually gave me my start a long time ago and funded the first um, inter-rater reliability assessment of that anxiety disorder interview. Um, and I also wanted to know that I have not received any, um, funding, um, or royalties for the anxiety, adapted anxiety interview yet, but it is hopefully finally going to be published by Oxford University Press and coming up out with the new version of the ATIS for DSM-5 for kids this year, after which point I might get royalties. Um, and of course, I do want to acknowledge the, the huge team of individuals uh, at UBC, but also at all the wonderful different places where I've worked and had opportunities to collaborate, the AJ Drexel Autism Institute, um, the um, Mind Institute at UC Davis, who has been working with me and leading the charge and all of that amygdala and biological work, um, and also the folks who contributed to the TASED trial, um, which was UCLA, University of South Florida, and um, Temple University back in the day. And I might, I'm definitely probably forgetting additional folks. Oh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia fund some of the, funded some of the initial work, which is part of my dissertation. Um, so, so many people contributed and I want to thank them as well as the families um, and the kids who have inspired all the work and contributed to it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We can we can end on that. And I really want to thank both Drs. Tom and Kearns for being here with us. Great talks, as people are saying in the chat. And to all of you who attended today at four o'clock at the end of the day, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you for supporting our women faculty and our AK Scholar program. And uh, until next time, thanks, everybody. Take care.